the correct way to do it is like, hey, none of these people agree with each other. What's up with that? Everyone wants to pretend it's a science, there's no politics. It's it's all politics. Brian Romanchuk is here to help me understand how Canadian dollars are made and how they circulate from the perspective of modern monetary theory. Romanchuk is a Quebec consultant, blogger, and independent author writing about economics. Tell me a bit about yourself and your background and what you do. I'm Brian Romanchuk. I, right now I work as a consultant and a writer, sort of part-time between the, the two sides. I used to work in finance, but I, I switched to working over myself some, some years ago. And my writing is about uh, what I used to do in finance, or relate the interesting parts of what I used to do in finance, which is looking at uh, how bond markets interact with the macro economy. And I, I have a website where I publish uh, mainly now more drafts of my articles. I mean, I, I talk about current events, and it's uh, bondeconomics.com which is sort of short for bond market economics, which is sort of the theme of the site. So you're primarily a writer and you used to work in finance. Yes. Okay. And um, your bio also says you used to, or you studied electrical engineering. Is there a parallel between your interest in electrical currents and financial currencies? Okay. There's a... That that could turn into a long answer. I'll give you the short answer. Sure. The, The... my, my undergraduate was electrical engineering, and then later on, I did a, a PhD in control systems engineering, which isn't as well known, but it's, it's a field of applied mathematics. The, since the controls were implemented as electronic, it's, it's normally tied to electrical engineering, but from a practical standpoint, if the applications are often mechanical or chemical systems. But in a, in a sense, it's it's very much a field of applied mathematics. I was on the theoretical wing of control theory, and to a certain extent, I turned into a mathematician, an applied mathematician. And so, in terms of applications uh, in economics, uh, not really that much directly, although ma- you know having a mathematical background helps. And in general, the danger is people coming from the physical sciences, many of them come in and look at economics and they try applying theories from their field and the results are usually horrible. Uh, in, in general, it's, it's, it's a bit of a trap, to be honest, uh, to try and think that you can just apply things from uh, the physical sciences. But there is a little uh, weird point in that Uh, mainstream economists actually took some optimal control theory from the 1950s and the 1960s, and they use it in their theory. And so actually, my background is really is applicable for discussing that. But uh, that theory is actually pretty terrible, and I hate it. Uh, I I don't I don't think it has any value. And uh, so it doesn't help you understand the economy, but I can understand the arguments about um, but but in general, yes, it's the when you look at it, the economy is how do people react, and there's some you can see there's some regularities in the data, but they the only the, the things sort of follow past trends until they don't, and so that's not a typical feature of something in physics and, or chemistry, and so this is this is the the issue here. Okay, let's get into talking about money then. Some basic ideas about money. How is a Canadian dollar created? Okay, um, just one thing about like money. Uh, the initial thing when people talk about money, uh, this is sort of the being a mathematician. You worry about definitions, and the you have to be careful with the definition of money. And I, in fact, had a book, uh, the title uh, "Abolish Money from Economics." where I basically complained how money is used in economics. Um, the Really, when we talk about money, there's at least two meanings. 
that get lumped together. One is sort of government money and one is bank money. And then you can have even other monies like uh, like a cryptocurrency. But the, the ones that we usually talk about are, you know, a, a government issued money and a bank issued one. And quite often they, they get lumped together. Uh, you talk about the money numbers and they just add the two together, but they're not exactly the same thing. They behave a bit different, differently. So you right off the bat, you have to sort of split it. Which one are we talking about? Anyway, so going back to a Canadian dollar, the, um, the Canadian dollar, like at its core, starts off as the government defines it, the Bank of Canada, which, which is owns a bank. It's owned by the federal government. And uh, initially, I think it was private, but it was nationalized, I think, around World War II. I don't have the dates handy. Uh, easy to find on their website. But they, basically, a Canadian dollar is defined as a unit on the, at the Bank of Canada. And they're, uh, it's, in essence, created cautiously by the, the federal government. And what you can do, the normal way uh, a, a person gets a, a Canadian dollar is you withdraw it from the bank. Well, where does a bank uh, get or you know, an ATM. Well, where, you know, where does the ATM get? Well, they have to get it from the Bank of Canada. And so, but for the bank or whomever else to get uh, those uh, dollar bills, they have to take it out of their, you know, account. At the, it's the same thing. It's, it's exactly the same thing when you take money out of your bank account. The, ba- the big bank, you know, the private bank takes money out of its account they get shipped the dollar bills, and then they do the same thing with you. You take money out of your bank account, they give you the dollar bills. So that's sort of how, you know, then the, then the dollar bills come into creation. They go out. Some of them never come back. Some might be collected, lost. But otherwise, they go to a retailer, then they come back to the bank, and uh, those old bills then recirculate back to the Bank of Canada. But... The, the beauty for the government point of view is that the cost of producing them is less than, you know, the face value. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's convenient for the government uh, because, you know, they, they, they in essence are selling these dollar bills at a very, very low cost. So in your book, Understanding Government Finance, you mentioned that the actual dollar bill is not a large portion of the economy. Most of the dollars are digital dollars on a ledger somewhere. So yeah. those are created either at the at a charter bank or at the Bank of Canada, correct? Yeah. yeah. Is that the distinction that you're talking about between yeah. the government dollar and the bank dollar? Is yeah. that what? Okay. Yeah. So like it, the distinction I'm hearing right now is just in how they're created. But like, where how does the distinction remain? Like, aren't, isn't it just one big pool of digital dollars once well, they're created? See, if you like, from you know, from the point of view of a, a bank customer, like a non-bank person in the private sector, for you, it's just an asset. You'd probably just put, you know, in your balance sheet, see, it's just cash, and we even worry about the distinction. But it's very, they're they're very different. Like, if you have a deposit in the bank, it's. Um, it, it's it's a liability of the bank. It's a, you are lending money to a bank, and whereas with a twenty dollar bill, it's a liability of the federal government. So, you know, so this is they they lump it together. Uh, I mean, they have money supply numbers and they add those two entries up. But who owns the like basically their their liability of two. Two completely different entities. One side, it's the federal government. The other side, it's the chartered banks. And in terms of the creation of bank deposits, that's usually the result of uh, loans. It's uh, that basically, if you say, uh, if a bank lo- lends you money, they say, okay, we'll give you ten thousand um, dollars. And so what happens is you're well, they aren't giving it to you. You get a ten dollar, ten thousand dollar increase in your deposit, but you also have a, a bank loan liability debt that you owe to the bank. So, you, so you don't, you know, you don't make a net profit. You just increase your assets and your liabilities by ten thousand. And that's the thing, though, is that 
because the deposits increase and those are counted in the money supply, that would create, that's called, that's money creation. That, see, that's being yeah. done by the bank. And so, and uh, by a private bank, which is different than something done by the federal government. And when the federal government creates these dollars, they do it by issuing stocks and bonds? They, they, um, yeah, they, this is sort of where it comes into MMT. They, they actually just write a check or an electronic transfer, I guess, maybe nowadays. The, uh, the, the way the, the, this comes down to what's happening under the hood in the financial system. And it gets, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, finicky. I mean, some people are really interested by this. But what happens is, is they, you know, if they, if they send me a check for $1,000, I don't know, let's say an income tax, uh, you know, refund or whatever. I guess if I get $1,000, they send me a check. I deposit in the bank. I, I mean, I get an immediate, you know, I get an increase in deposit. And, um, you know, that's money creation. But what happens is, is that, oh, the federal government, I mean, the bank doesn't lose money. The the bank says, you know, goes, goes to the bank account and say, by the way, the, the your, your, your client, because the federal government is a client of the Bank of Canada, has written a check for a thousand bucks, so we want a thousand dollars. Thank you very much. And so then the Bank of Canada transfers uh, money, it does does a, a transfer on the account of the uh, private bank, and they, you know, they sort of do these transfers all the time, various means. But the the way the accounting works is eventually the the, the government. Uh, issues bonds and the, what what they they issue a government bond or a bill and the bill goes out and the, uh, someone in the private sector buys it and they pay for the bond or bill to get interest at least they did in the good old days now it's now they don't get much and the but the payment goes and so the the, the federal government gets a cash inflow to their their uh their account at the Bank of Canada. So, the I, to a certain extent, you could say they don't have to issue the bonds, but the way the system operates now is they issue the bonds because otherwise, if they're writing the checks, um, there would be a big the the banks would start pile up deposits at the Bank of Canada, and. The, the Canadian system didn't work this way exactly. But if you looked in the United States, what would happen is, is interest rates uh, would actually collapse to zero. So the, they need to issue bonds to keep interest rates away from zero. Um, the, the way Canada works, they could actually keep positive interest rates. But it's, it's really a question of uh, accounting between the federal government and the Bank of Canada. Uh, how they operate, and they could do this in a number of different ways. So I've come to see bonds, and I imagine a bond, even though it's probably a digital thing, I imagine it as like a piece of paper that just says, this is a bond. And it's yep. issued as like an excuse to print money, but also a means of control to make sure that there's some kind of back and forth flow to allow them to control the inter interest rates. Well, the like a, like a, just to go the first part, they're, they're all basically electronic entries now. Uh, they used to be, if you go back to the 1980s, you used to have bearer bonds. And if you look at two great Christmas films from the 80s, uh, they involve them. Uh, Die Hard, they had bearer bonds in the safe. And even in Home Alone, one, when they wanted to rob the house, they said that they would have negotiable spirit as bearer bonds. So bearer bonds used to be a thing, but they were very good for uh, a way of avoiding taxes. And so um, and they were stolen a lot. So the government stopped issuing them some time ago. But they used to be a thing up until the 1980s. But now it's all electronic. And it's just, a you know, the standard way of describing a bond is it's uh, you have a principal payment of $100, which is paid some, uh, some date in the future. And then have a coupon. You, you, in Canada, you get a coupon every six months on on a specific date. Usually, so that's like a pay a payment. Is yeah, a coupon? Is a, yeah, June June first, December first for Canadian uh, most Canadian bonds. Okay. 
And the the issue them, I mean, the 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 issuance is to because uh, it's basically if we go back to uh, like if we want to discuss the economic reason, there's some accounting reasons uh, stretching back to past history. The reason uh, economically why they're needed uh, for the system now is that if if they spend money, they you know they get a, the the payment goes out, and then uh, the, the private bank gets a deposit at, at the Bank of Canada. But the 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 the, the, the private banks don't want to leave their balance sheets sitting at the Bank of Canada. And so what this what the bond issuance does is the whoever is paying for the bond is going to pay via a bank. And so when the so who, whoever the final buyer is, it could be the bank, but it could be their customer, they send the payment to the federal government. And that reduces the, the private bank's balance at the Bank of Canada. And if you go before 2020, what actually happened was is that the private banks, their balance at the end of the day was always zero. That was their target. And they'd be pretty close to it. Uh, and they'd missed by a few million dollars, um, which might sound like a lot, but they, you know, they on a daily basis, there's uh, tens of billions, hundreds of billions flowing through their their accounts, and they might the the net miss would be maybe a million dollars or two. Their objective is to get that uh, balance down to zero, and that's how they the, the bond issuance drains the, the deposits that would have been sitting in the bank of uh, Canada. They they're used to pay for new bond issuance. And okay. so in, instead of the, 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 the federal government having their liabilities just being private banks leaving deposit central at, at the Bank of Canada, instead, throughout the private sector, people hold government bonds as assets, as financial assets. And that's banks. They, they use them for liquidity management. Insurance companies need them because they need liquidity and pension funds, and less and less uh, households. Uh, nowadays, pe- households don't own as many bonds as they used to do in the old days. At, at best, they might have bond funds. So when a, a bank creates their debt dollar, like if they loan me $10,000, yeah. and I pay that $10,000 back, that $10,000 is then kind of destroyed, right? Yeah, you pay down the loan, so the, the loan disappears, and the bank bank deposit disappears so money money the the private money disappears that way how does government money disappear um if you like the returning it uh you basically the money returns to the federal government and if you deposit like if we talk about like the the bank notes um you you return it to a bank or deposit in the bank machine, but in most cases, it's via retail. Most people take money out and then they spend it in, you know, uh, stores and then the stores ship it back to banks. And uh, I mean, the, the, the banks keep a certain amount in circulation, I mean, they keep it in their vaults, but basically sooner or later, it'll go back to the uh, Bank of Canada. And so the, the Bank of Canada, in essence, will buy back those banks you know, it's notes, uh, like the dollar, you know, $20 bills, they, they buy them back from the banks and they credit their account. You know, it's the same, same thing as we do. They, yes. They're just handing in the, the notes for, to, for a, you know, a bank balance. So if the government can basically just write a check for whatever expenses yeah. it has, what is the actual function of taxes? Oh yeah, oh that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That was the other thing. I got so distracted with the, that money. Yeah, the, the more important one is taxes. The other way of returning money is you pay your taxes, and whenever you pay taxes to the federal government, uh, this is provincial, is separate. But if, if if you're talking to the federal government, yeah. you write them a check, and if you pay attention, it's supposed to go to the Receiver General of Canada. If, if you look at uh, you know, make your check out to the receiver general. It, it, and it goes into an account that basically the money, you know, the, the deposit that you had in your bank, they 
the bank subtracts it from your account, and they, they do a transfer uh, to the receiver general account at the Bank of Canada. So it disappears. The, any tax you pay disappears from the private sector, and it gets put into the government's account, uh, the receiver general account at the uh, Bank of Canada. And so that's probably why we have taxes is to dist- so there's not too much money in the system. Yeah, it's I mean the the, the function of taxes. Um, I think the the that sort of is the standard financial reason, like the, the normal financial reasoning. The uh, the argument is that the from a theoretical point of view, uh, they they need to do this to create a demand for the currency. What by destroying uh, the currency, it it I, I, by imposing taxes on people, it forces people to get dollars, Canadian dollars, to pay their taxes. You can't you you know you can't use gold, you can't use an American dollar. You need Canadian dollars to to pay your Canadian tax bill. So it creates a demand for Canadian dollars. And, and so it, 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 it forces the people in the private sector to get their hands on it. You know, they have to get their hands on Canadian dollars. And so then the currency has value. Because the, the problem, let's say, with a fiat currency, when you look at it, say, why, why am I going, you know, why is this bill, say, uh, you know, with label $20, why is it worth anything? It's just a piece of paper, well, plastic nowadays. You know, it's just a piece of plastic or what's this digital, you know, why why am I working at this job for, you know, just to get a piece of paper? Well, I mean, the idea is, okay, you 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 want the dollar bills because you can get stuff for it, but you need to kick that off with, well, there has to be a reason someone somewhere need, you know, needs to get dollars in the first place and taxes do that job. And if you look at colonial, like in colonial societies in Africa, that's exactly how they, they imposed Western-style currencies on the population. If GDP is supposed to rise 3% every year and yeah. inflation ideally is supposed to rise 2% every year, then in the final calculation, it looks like we're presumably creating more value every year. What yeah. generates that value? That's, um, well, I mean... Like historically, the uh, population, the U.S. and Canada, the working age population was growing at about one percent a year. So, if everyone was employed and you know doing stuff, the economy uh, would just grow up one percent a year in in line with the the population growth. And not not everyone has a job, but you say. If, you know, if you sort of go from year one to year two, if it's the same percentage of the population that's employed, there's just more people employed because the population is growing. So they should produce more stuff. But in general, you get a bit more. You get a a productivity growth. Uh, Usually, you know, one percent, maybe one and a half percent, two percent in recent decades. But historically, it was much higher. If you if you go back to the. 1800s, early 1900s, you had much higher uh, productivity growth, um, you know, which you see in some emerging markets. You see that, let's say, in China. You, you know, in the industrialization process, you get a lot more output, basically because uh, a lot of it's driven by, you know, you get more, ag- you know, more agricultural uh, productivity. And so that meant they had less people working on farms for the same amount of produce. And then that meant people could go work in factories and produce more stuff. And then the factories could produce more stuff. And so that that's sort of the reason why uh, you, you get more real stuff being produced. Um, you have to be somewhat careful, though. Real GDP, one, it's it's a real sausage making uh, enterprise. What exactly does gross domestic product uh, re- represent? It sort of works, but it's you know you it's a bit uh, you know some some of it it's not really clear because like when you're in services and things like that, 
you know, how do you, what's the value of some of these services and so on and so forth. So you can sort of debate about, you know, how comparable the numbers are. A minute ago, you mentioned rising interest rates, and that's one of the big things you hear about on CBC and the news a lot is, you know, the Bank of Canada is lowering or raising interest rates. But there's, you know, I have interest rates on my credit. They're not talking about that. What are they talking about when they say they're going to raise yeah. interest rates yeah. or lower the, interest rates? Okay. The, the interest rates that um, when we talk about the Bank of Canada, the way it works is they they have a policy rate. There was a... There's a, actually two of them. There's a ban, but uh, roughly speaking, you have a you have a policy rate that you know that they say, and that is for an overnight borrowing at risk-free rates. And what that comes down to is uh, between banks, because banks lend each other money because they have shortfalls, and they don't want to like. Let, let's say, you know, customers of Bank A are shipping money to Bank B. Uh, they don't, Bank A doesn't want to have to sell stuff all the time just to make up that transfer. What they do is they're shipping money to Bank B. So they know B has extra money. So they just borrow the money overnight from Bank B. And then, you know, the thing might reverse the next day. So you have an inner bank market. And then you also have the... Over, like overnight rates for short, like you have a uh, short-term securities, and this this ties into the government bond market where I used to uh, be an analyst of. The if you look at sort of the government of Canada, they have all these bonds, and they have bonds for maturities from you know over the, the next day, or just we say overnight, all the way actually to fifty years now, I believe. The 50 years didn't exist when I when I was uh, working, but they and so at the very short end, they though the government of Canada rates are going to be tied to that Bank of Canada rate, and then w that then feeds down because let's say you have a one month one month bill, right, a, a bill or a bond. Well, its its interest rate is going to be very close to that overnight rate. Because you instead of buying the one month, you could just you know roll you know overnight for a month. You know obviously they can't be too different. Um, you sort of say that one month rate is going to be equal to the average where you think the overnights are going to be for the next month, and so it's all sort of tied together. So what what it comes down to is the Bank of Canada sets the shortest maturity. And then further along the curve, uh, people are paid actually a fair amount of money. They're, they're paid money to guess where's the Bank of Canada going to put the interest rates in the future, and they price the bonds accordingly. And so that sets the, the government of Canada curve. And so if you go and if you ever buy a bond from a broker for the like the 10 people who actually do that nowadays, if, if, you, if you look at it and you see the yields – those yields are being set by traders saying where do they think the, the overnight rate's going to go. I and mean, there's maybe a bit more complicated than that, but the, at the core, that's what's driving it. And the thing is, if you're a bond investor, uh, you can buy Government Canada or you can buy other bonds. And the most important ones are mortgage bonds right now. The from you know from from a household point of view, they could be corporate bonds, but there's also uh, mortgage bonds. What what happens is when you get a mortgage in Canada, the they'll usually they'll get insurance and they slap them all into a security that's sold, and then people say they can buy these uh, you know pooled mortgage bonds, and th so what happens is is the mortgage interest rate that banks offer are tied to where are those bonds trading in that, uh, what's called the secondary market. Where, where are these mortgage bonds trading? And that's where they'll post their mortgage rates roughly. And so like if you're, if you're uh, you know, looking at buying a house or refinancing a mortgage, you know, you're, you're worried about what the bank account is doing because then you have to decide, do I want to, do I want to fix it for five years? Do I float it and hope it's a lower rate and then try and fix it later? Whatever. That that's where it comes down to. 
But see, if like a credit card, no, that, that's a, a, a much higher penalty rate. And it's not really tied. Um, but for, for a consumer, your, your main, like the Bank of Canada, you care about the Bank of Canada because of mortgage rates. Okay. So the, yeah, the Bank of Canada sets these interest rates that only directly matter for the big banks, but then that affects our mortgages. Okay. So the Liberals re- le- uh, released their budget yesterday. And some people are complaining about a big deficit. If the deficit gets too high, we can't defa- we can't actually default on those debts and go bankrupt, right? Well, <laughs> can they? This is um, the you know because basically, if you're bu- from the point of view of buying the bonds, if you say they can't, that's you're saying oh, there's you know if you're sort of telling people there's no chance they can default. That's that's an opinion about a security which I would be very cautious about giving. the 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 way the the way to think of it is they can't be forced to default, but they okay. could decide to default. It's a, they could voluntarily decide. Ah, we don't feel like paying. Um, but normally, you know, they you know bondholders are generally wealthy and. Uh, in, in a sense, well, powerful from the economic system, and they'd be very unhappy because because it's not just it's not just a few rich people. I mean, it, it would destroy the banking system. And oh, how many people have deposits in the banks? I mean, how many how many businesses need to get loans from banks? You know, the when when the banking system implodes, the you know the real economy collapses, as other countries saw in two thousand eight. And it destroys people's pension funds, uh, blows up insurance companies. Like there's a lot of there, there would be a lot of side effects of defaulting, and uh, but you know, you know, it's it, it's discussed a lot, but it's not a very like it, it's discussed a lot in commentary, but it it re- realistically it's too painful. It's, it's politically uh, an exceedingly painful option, and it's. Uh, I mean, I there. I mean, it, I don't see it as very plausible. So, for the impression that I get from reading your books and Stephanie Kelton's book is simply that the the deficit isn't necessarily a problem. The the thing to pay attention to is inflation. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the it's it's a little bit subtle, uh, but what it comes down to is the deficit. Like the it's a fiscal deficit, and it what's happening is it's in, like if the government is spending more than it's taking in from taxes, it's injecting income into the rest of the economy. Um, so they're they're spending money, you know they're you know they're they're spending more than they're taking in. Well, that implies that businesses or households are taking in more. So somebody somebody's income is being pushed up by by this, and the if we're not worried about defaulting, you know the what what's happening is is they they need to run deficits because typically because people want to save people people sock away a certain amount of income and they they pile up savings and so they're withdrawing spending from the the like there are loops or circuits of spending. And if, if you pull that money out of the loop, uh, you know someone you know s- someone is not getting uh, their income, and so what's happening is the deficit is offsetting that. I mean, and it really depends on the state of the economy. Uh, like if you're in a, a place where you have very high fixed investment, you you would expect actually surpluses because investing. Um, boosts the economy because it's a form of spending that's not an expense. You know, if if you invest in a let's you know a, a railway tracks or whatever, you you're you're spending money, but it's not an immediate expense. So you don't really you know they just raise money and they don't mind it. But you know the the people receiving the money, hey, that's income for them. And so you get a like that's you know that's injecting money into the economy like a deficit. And if if you have enough of that going on. You then, you know, the government actually naturally would run a surplus to slow down the economy. But uh, we haven't sort of been in that kind of investment boom 
in a very long time. Like you have to go back to almost the 1950s. There was a little bit of an investment boom in the 90s, but uh, you know the, you don't see that. We're 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 very slow, sluggish growth since the 1990s, and so the the normal state of affairs is a deficit where the government, the the, the federal government is injecting money just to keep steady. Uh, you know, steady, steady growth, two percent inflation, which is what we've seen since the nineteen nineties, with with a little hiccups around various crises, and obviously last year, which is uh, very unusual. So that kind of speaks to how you said that government liabilities are public assets. Mm-hmm. Okay, so inflation. When is the exact moment that inflation happens? Yeah, um, the inflation, like the uh, what the the inflation is, it's a general rise in the price level, and to certain extent, it's a bit hard to tell because prices change all the time. Is it fair to say it's like when Tim Hortons raises their coffee by five cents, or when I get a raise? Is that inflation? Um, yeah, it's uh, the you know if it's just Tim Hortons raising their their coffee, like if it's, just, if it's just a coffee price increase, nothing, technically it's a little bit, but if someone else lowers their price, then actually it's a wash. And the, uh, usually you got to look at the whole aggregate for, to, to really, for inflation to make sense, you have to sort of step back. It's, it, it only really makes sense to talk about on the whole aggregate because you're always seeing some prices go up, some go down, and it, you can't conclude anything. And that's why you have various price indices. And usually, you like you have like, you have average wage measures, and then you have uh, consumer price indices. But then you also have like for producers, like you know, let's say for what businesses see. And the usually when people talk about inflation, um, it's switched to be mainly what people are talking about the CPI. They're talking about consumer prices, but. It could be more generic, but and usually though, like in, in terms of when it's happening, it, it's uh, like it, it's got to be happening sort of continuously across the whole economy. And you usually it's, it's supposed to be the idea is that it's not just a one-off thing, because occasionally, you know, you could have like a tax increase that raises prices, but that's like if it just happens once, it's a one-off shock, and people, you know. You know the price level rises, but if if it's not if it's not repeated, some people say, well, that's not really inflation. But that's sort of getting into semant- uh, a semantic argument. So, is it just like we always want to increase profits, so it's just natural that there's going to be inflation? Or you also mentioned bottlenecks. I mean, I'm 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 writing a book on inflation. The 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 causes of inflation. It's it's fairly tricky, um, but the 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 usual story is that uh like if you look at like a, of a firm they they produce you know they pay people to produce a certain amount of output that they can sell for let's say it's a uh, uh, hundred dollars per worker and uh, and and so in, in you know a day or something so the 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 the, the worker has a output that can be sold for a hundred dollars. And so then the question is, how much does the how much do they pay the worker? And how much to keep them profits? And so they might okay, maybe they pay the worker ninety dollars and they keep ten dollars. Who knows? But that comes down to a wage negotiation, and to a certain extent, uh, the, the argument goes that uh, like when you saw in the seventies, you have unions worker pushing for higher wages to increase their share of the profit. And then once that start eats too much into profit margins, and then the uh, firms start raising their output prices, and so you get an upward spiral in prices. Um, like I, I don't want to go in like it's it's fairly complicated. No one really agrees on the inflation process, but that's sort of what's going. On. It, it's it's sort of wages and prices rising and. There's, it comes down a bit, you know, what, what is the split between workers and firms? Okay. And I think I missed part of your question, but you asked about bottlenecks. Right now, I mean, there is a good bottleneck story, 
but it's it's a, a lumber. Um, there, I mean, I'm not an expert on this. I'm I'm going off just sort of a news report, but it seems plausible. But what's happened is is that the uh, the Canadian government, I'm not sure which governments, they, they cut back on logging permits because the, it was unsustainable, uh, the, the rate of, of logging. And then what happened was is that, you know, a couple of years ago, it wasn't too bad because there was less construction. But, this, you know, uh, the, the cut in the interest rate, there's been a, a boom in the housing markets in Canada and the U.S. And they need Canadian lumber for framing. The U.S. produces a lot of lumber, um, but a lot, of it, you know, what what they produce isn't good for framing houses, and so there's a shortage of the the framing lumber, and so what's happened is you just can't get your hands on framing lumber, and prices are, you know, doubling every week or something like that. I, I don't know the exact prices, but they're 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 taking off. So that's an example of hey, there's a shortage, and so the lumber prices have gone through the roof. But that's, you know, that's, that's a story about lumber. That's not everywhere. But the, the issue is, like, if you look back in the 1970s, you had a lot of stories like this, but they were happening everywhere. Um, well, the, the biggest one was oil prices, which was OPEC uh, did some oil embargoes. Uh, and, but then there were also um, serious problems with, with food shortages. Like, everything went wrong with the food supply in the 1970s anchovies disappeared uh off portugal things like this and so so food prices exploded and so each one of those things was sort of localized but they all happened at the same time and then eventually hey that you know the overall prices did rise so that i mean that was sort of you know where bottlenecks had a major implication for for inflation we don't have time to get into the history of money and debt but I do remember you taking issue with Adam Smith's image of modern dollars replacing an obsolete barter system. And I had read in David Graeber's book about the history of debt, where he paints kind of a picture of complex relationships of obligations and human connection being slowly replaced by a strictly quantified debt market. And now most of that debt is owed to big banks or big government. Now, this might be outside of your wheelhouse of strictly economics, but can you speak to like what we've lost in that transition transition, and what we've gained? In the transition towards sort of modern, modern money, as it were, is that um, the, it, it's tied to capitalism. And uh, the, before everything was sort of personalized, now it's depersonalized, but it makes it easier to run businesses, run big businesses, and to borrow lots of money. And that's the thing is that, like, with the, the banks, I mean, uh, the ability of the banks to marshal large amounts of saving to do big projects, uh, and it's not just the banks, it's banks and bond markets, Th that's what's different. It would be very difficult. You couldn't build things like a railroad uh, you know, back sort of in early, earlier systems is that you, you just didn't, uh, before it would be sort of, you'd have a few rich people. I mean, you had the, something like banks, even in like Roman era, but it was, it, they were, they were, you know, sort of rich individual had banks, but they, they didn't have sort of the deep pockets that, that you could uh, get. Uh, money for these big projects. I mean, they had enough; they could finance various kings' wars and things. But you not not to the same ex scale and the same level of you know professionalism that that you've had unleashed since the industrial revolution. So whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But uh, that's that's society that we live in. I mean, every everything is is, is on a base of some you know very hefty capital investment. You can say, what is the purpose of the system? That's what it's doing. That's interesting. It's interesting to read about the history of money, um, the little bit that I've read, and to see the kind of machine that we basically live in and the complexity of it. And money is some kind of circulation that keeps things running, which uh, it seems to tie into your, like you're a proponent of modern monetary theory, which kind of paint, for me at least, as coming from the outside, paints a picture of 
just how it's a tool, how money is a very useful tool societally. I want to ask about GDP growth real quick. Why is GDP growth so important? And what would happen if the economy stopped growing? Okay. The um, GDP growth, it's, it's, it's very big for business cycle analysis, how you define a business cycle. And, um, you know, for me, you know, my job was, my interest is business cycles. And so that, uh, that's why sort of I'm interested, but the the reason why it, gross domestic product is all the production in the con domestically produced in a year and or a time period, but by itself, uh, I mean it, it, everyone talks about GDP, but the the more interesting side is gross domestic income which is all the income in the economy in a year. And the way these are constructed, they equal each other by definition. The, 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 the way gross domestic income equals gross domestic product. And gross domestic income, well, why do we care about income? Well, you know, that's the person's you. Well, do you like, you know, losing your job? Do, prof, do businesses like uh, less profits? No, no, they do not. And uh, so that's that's really why the uh, for whatever reason, econ economists prefer to talk about the production side. But from a practical standpoint, it's more the income side that that is, you know, what why we care. So if we if we if it didn't grow though, wouldn't we just have the same number of jobs and everything would be fine? Um, the you, I mean, Japan has reached a stage of uh, nominal GDP growth of about zero, and they're 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 doing quite well to be honest. Okay. The but uh, the lack of growth, it's like yeah, I mean it 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 doesn't. It, it wouldn't really matter, but the way the system is set up financially, we like uh, growth. Like, like you know, the, the you know we're targeting two percent inflation, and basically there's a little bit of inflation. People call it grease in the wheels of capitalism, but you you have a certain you, you expect a certain amount of in nominal income growth, and what that does is. It just makes it easy, you know, uh, you know, you know, you could be in the same job and it's easier to make your uh, mortgage payments over time because, you know, even even though you can say may, maybe you're just keeping up with inflation, but what's happening is that hey, you've you've got more, you know, a larger dollar income, and so it's easier just to make mortgage payments with, you know, if if you fix the interest rates. So the it, it's but the question is. Um, does this have to tie in with greater usage of resources? Because there's a lot of talk about like you know no growth or zero or degrowth. Um, you like could we be using less gasoline, you know, less energy, blah blah blah. Um, actually, you know, they're they're not they're not as tied historically. They're tied. And there's a lot of people running around, especially people from the physical sciences. And this is the problem uh, with the physical sciences. They believe they've discovered uh, a law of nature. And that's, just, and that's not. It's just that's the way the economy was historically. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's the, we could have growing incomes, in, you know, dollar terms, and actually just, you know, uh, have less stress on the economy. We just do different things. And... You know, it's it's that's you know, and and that's the thing is it's, you know, if if I go back to you know I'm you know, I grew up in the '70s. If if you look at you know a consumption basket, you know in the '70s, and there is you know now some things are the same, but you know most things are radically different, right? You know, how much should I spend on a cell phone? Ninety, well zero, and you know and it's the things you, you you the what you're doing over over uh, you know. 20 years apart, 30 years apart, uh, there, things are changing so much that it's really hard to necessarily compare. I mean, some things are this, like food while well, you, you eat, but even, even eating habits have changed and things like that. So it's, it's really, you know, it, uh, you know it's, 
society could be different. You know, you could be consuming less real resources, but just you know, nominal incomes grow because that makes everyone happy. I mean, I, I to me, that's sort of the most uh, sort of the most benign outcome. If if you sort of worry about you know, because we are hitting resource extraction, you know, there's physical resource extraction limits, yeah. and we are running into those. And uh, but yeah, I mean the you know GD, nominal GDP, and the thing is, the way it's measured, real GDP will probably grow, but that's probably because the you know the real GDP is being overstated by various effects. That really you know and some you know if you sort of, if if you sort of harsh you say well actually no it's kind of shrinking but you know it's just it's, it's just an artifact of how how they're calculating it. Okay. So if you had to pick the biggest change to happen to the economic system in Canada in the past 100 years, what's the biggest change? Well, the, it's, it's got to be the, uh, the, ri- the rise of the welfare state. The, um, that, that's, that's the thing that has changed everything, for the, for, largely for the better. Um, whereas before, like if, if you look, let's say, in the Depression, the Depression era, uh, people people were starving to death, and uh, governments said, "Oh, we can't do anything because we have to protect the, the Canadian dollar and the gold standard." I mean, but that that kind of thinking is is gone, and uh, you know, so basically, we we've largely ensured a reasonable standard, minimum standard of living. We you know uh, elderly poverty uh, is, is largely being eliminated, and but you know, you we have. Uh, some pockets, uh, you know, we have some obvious problem like on, on, say, the reserves, and uh, but you know, other. I mean, so it's it's not a utopia, but you know, a lot of the the problems, glaring problems that exist in the 1930s have disappeared, and our, so our economic problems are a lot smaller in a sense. I mean, you know, maybe in in a real sense, maybe we're we're wrestling with the resource limits that are tougher than they were a hundred years ago when, you know, we still had lots of oil, uh, you know, oils largely hadn't been touched. Alberta, would, you know, hadn't been touched their oil yet, but you know, the, uh, but you know, from the point of view of the citizens, things are generally much, much less harsh. So let's talk a little bit about modern monetary theory. For people who don't know what it is, uh, you wrote a book about it called uh, "Modern Monetary Theory and the Recovery." Yeah, yeah. How how would you explain that to somebody, to a layperson? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's. <laughs> the, after writing the book, I discovered it's harder and harder for me to describe the. I know the, you, you've the got like two whole chapters on it. You've got narrow and broad. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. There, there. It's. Because I'm I'm looking at it from the point of view of sort of economic theory. The I mean I, I mean obviously I like my book, but uh, Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, is gonna be a lot easier for uh, a lay a lay person to start with. Certainly, yeah. My, that, mine that eased me into your books. Her yeah, book yeah. So my mine, mine would be more advanced. Like you would say, I want to know more. Then, uh, then that's sort of where my book would come in. But a lot of it is aimed at people who have some knowledge. But it, the MMT, the reason from my point of view is that it's a bit hard to explain is that there are certain parts that people always talk about, which I as you mentioned is narrow MMT, and then there's broader. The, the broad MMT is attempting uh, to replace all of mainstream economics. I mean, it's part of uh, it's called post-Keynesian. Like there was, there was a split with an economics Rough. It started after World War II, but it got very serious. Nineteen by the nineteen seventies, they split completely. You know, the the mainstream basically started. You know, the the, the post Keynesians disappeared from existence as far as the mainstream was concerned, and the uh, post Keynesians want to replace all of mainstream economics. And MMT is part of that group. Okay. They're a faction, and there's many factions within the post Keynesians. And so, obviously, if you want to replace all of the economics, you want to summarize it, well, it's all of economics. There's a lot of stuff in economics. But uh, th- there's a narrower bit, which is usually what people talk about. And if you look at the deficit, it's mainly on that part. 
and it's more about government finance. And the, I guess the simplest thing we sort of discussed here is that the government, it's, it's the observation that really a government can't be, a government that controls its currency, you have to be slightly careful here. If, 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 you, if, if you control the currency that you borrow with, like Canada or the United States, you, you can't be forced into a default. It's it's a you know a, you know government could decide to default uh, you know these uh, pass an act of parliament but normally you know they don't want to do that they can't so the government has to say you know uh, they're not limited by what bond what lenders tell them that they can spend what what they can say is what really limits our spending on the public purse purpose and the uh, it's it's in, basically it comes down to you know a flip inflation, you know they hit a constraint they just can't buy something. Like, let's say the government of Canada wanted to buy a whole bunch of framing lumber. Well, they can't. It doesn't exist. <laughs> you know it's well it, it, it's it's just there's there's no more available, so they couldn't buy it at any price. So that's a real constraint, and that's what they have to. That's what you're up against. You have to say because uh, historic the you know the. The story is being uh, that you see in the business press. Oh, they're going to run out of money, and no, it's not that. It's just like what, and, and you know, basically, you can't have nice stuff because the government's going to run out of money. This the government isn't going to run out of money when they're talking about defense expenditures or tax ta ta tax cuts for corporations, defense expenditures, tax cuts the rich. Oh no, no, no problem. But if it's oh, poor people want no, no, no. You, there's no money for that, so it, it's it's there. There's very selective use of running out of money, and um, you know it's it's whatever it's politics, but um, so. But we can take a bit of the, like what listening to people talk about modern monetary theory, we can take a bit of the edge off our concern about the deficit, and put that concern maybe on inflation and think about that instead. Yeah, it, it shows that the politicians generally they're doing a little bit of. Um, they're putting on a show when they complain about the deficit. Yeah, yeah, the um, yeah, that's that's basically it. I mean, that they want to, uh, especially in Canada, they have a, uh, it's it's the powers that be uh, are generally to say they're they're unfriendly to MMTs and understatement. They they're um, you know they, there's a certain narrative. And uh, they love surpluses, like, and that this is, you know, which in the United States, uh, they, they used to be this way, but uh, the, um, you know, that, that sort of viewpoint has lost a lot of ground. Canada, I wouldn't say, I mean, has not followed that trend. Can Canada thinking has not changed since the 1990s. And, um, you know, they say, well, we're a small country, we'll Canadian dollar collapse. Blah blah blah. I mean, it's, but but the, you know, that's the thing is that you know, and you know, but but realistically, if if everyone was sensible, they say, what can we do? And and obviously, like in twenty twenty, the the deficits are off the charts. And I I haven't really looked at the data because like every, all the like the economic data for twenty twenty is utterly you know they're they're quite literally off the charts. Any any sort of time series you look at they're just totally abnormal uh yeah. compared to thing and yet you know the the, the the government did what they had to do i'm, I'm not going to say it was perfect they did roughly what they had to do and they cushioned the blow as best as they could for for, for people i mean you know it could have you know things could have been done better but it was chaos on the initial lockdown nothing could get organized properly so and you know now you know that's the thing is could they run deficits like that forever probably not i mean they, they were able to do that you know they were they were able to inject all that spending because people you know couldn't spend the money on stuff and they you know they weren't working but you know as the vaccinations kick in uh it'll naturally naturally the economy I mean, you know the the you know people will be going back to work and people are you know people who have savings can start spending i mean once we can start traveling again uh you know people are gonna say hey let's go travel let's spend money and that'll you know there should be a little bit of a boom coming up um you know assuming these variants i mean i'm i'm optimistic that these variants will go away and maybe i'm wrong about that but uh 
Uh, but you know, eventually with the the vaccine, th things will boom, and then things go back to normal. But that's the thing. See, if if you worried about the deficit last year, it would be a disaster. I mean, they needed to have the, the ridiculous deficits. I mean, next year, yeah, I mean, this, the deficit is going to narrow, and it's probably going to narrow a lot. But it'll do that on its own because, hey, people people who are working pay tax. And inflation hasn't skyrocketed. It's risen, but yeah, yeah, okay, it's so. everything. Yeah, everything's disrupted. I mean, it's hard. Like, well, lumber isn't purely, but yeah, there's all kinds of disruptions. So, you know, the, hopefully that sorts itself out. Yeah. So, why is modern monetary theory called a theory still? Um, it's it's well, it's I mean, it is a body of theory, and okay. uh, it's a body of theory. I mean, in some ways, the advantage of MMT, calling it MMT, is that it's sort of just, it's a label that doesn't mean anything, like a lot, like a lot of firms. They just go by their acronym. They lost the original meaning. Um, the, the, because actually, the, the, it, it's actually from an in joke. It was, um, it was, it was, uh, it was a joke by Keynes. And I, 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 it roughly went that he says modern money is a creature because there was a debate whether money was came from the private sector, the government, uh, like who sort of issued it first. And basically, Keynes he looked at it, says, you know, modern money is being, uh, as a, you know, as a creature of the state. It's been this way for four thousand years. Uh, so it was, it was a little. I mean, I, it would well, it was funnier than how I said it, but it <laughs> says. It's an economist humor, but basically, it was modern modern money's been around for four thousand years, ha ha ha, and but that's where the name came from, and you know, it's I, I, like I'm a little bit squishy, but you know, it, it's it. I don't know. At this point, it'd be hard to rename. I don't think it has a better name. I mean, at best, you, you could call it heterodox economics, but it, it's. I, I don't I don't uh, they like it, 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 it's a it, it's it's a school of thought it's got that name and it's sort of too late to give it a different one but going by the MMT you don't have to have to think about what it stands for anymore and you wrote your book for basically other economists or people who know generally more than I do Stephanie yeah. Kelton wrote her book for the public for the most part yeah um ha to what extent like does it does it matter if most of us learn what modern monetary theory is? But because, like right now, we mostly accept the language of the politicians and prominent econ economists, and we're not so much in a position to judge the intricate mechanics of different economic theories. So even if modern monetary theory is a better framework and is fairly arcane, how can you get people on board, or do you even want to get people on board? Uh, I'm like I, I'm. Like I'm, I'm not. Uh, I mean, I sort of write for my my audience. I'm uh, somewhat strange politics. I, I I'm not. I I'm not too heavily involved. Like, uh, I I my my attitude, my personal attitude is actually from like the old prairie populace, and you only got involved when you saw something really wrong and you change it. That was sort of the attitude. Uh, you came in, made it, made a reform, or forced someone else to do the reform and leave. And then go back home, and you know that's that's to a certain extent that's how how the uh, how the, the prairie populist movements went, but the I I would say it would be nice if you know there's less myths around. I mean the the advantage of the Celtic but that that basically you know in, instead of sort of accepting well you know we're doing some random money, you just say look what's the actual problem. You know why? Why can't we do X? And oh, well, what's what's the actual point? And not just rely on, well, I've got you know I have a PhD from Harvard and I've got a uh, optimal control model that proves that you can't do that. Well, no, actually, your model doesn't say that. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the sort of arcane debates are going to be between economists. But it, the I, I think there's still an element of the population say, no, nah, you're just snowing us. You got to say, look, what. What really is the matter? What you know? What is the actual honest truth? And to a certain extent, if if you know, uh, if you look at the mainstream, certainly in the U.S., they're saying, well, actually, you know, like 
say, well, you know what MMT is saying, we sort of knew all along. That's, that's been the switch. And so now you're debating, and, and to a certain extent, the debates are better, but they're still going to be, it's, it's, they're, they're, there's a huge divide between, um, you know, the sort of free market libertarian approach and well, everybody else. And the, uh, the, like the, the free market parties have swung to a libertarian uh, worldview. I mean, which, you know, their, you know, their view is a little bit nuts, even a few decades ago, but they've basically, they've taken over and that's really, that's not going to go away. And to a certain extent, it's, it's, devolved, it's, it's almost straight, pure party line politics now. And the you know, modern, modern monetaries can't really help you with that because it, it, it isn't, it, it doesn't really say, like, it's a, it's a description of the economy. I mean, there, there, there's programs that fit in, but, you know, capitalism versus government control, there, there isn't uh, an answer. It's not like you can say Marxism where you can say, ah, this is, this is what's going to happen. Uh, state withers away, blah, blah. You know, it's, 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 it's more vague. And people are going to be arguing on a straight party line, and that that's not going to go away, um, to, to be honest. So your MMT book mentions a jobs guarantee, where anybody who's unemployed, uh, the government will basically provide them with a job. Um, why does modern monetary theory suggest this or recommend it? Like, what are the economic theories or benefits? Well, I mean, this this is sort of a core part of MMT. It's a little bit arcane, but what it does, it gives the government uh, an inflation control. Because what you've done is you've created an, an effect, a true minimum wage. Like right now, there's a minimum wage, but if you're unemployed, the minimum wage is actually still zero. Here, the private sector, uh, they've got to match that wage. They've got to match the conditions. I mean, it'd be theoretically possible they could pay less than the the job guarantee. I mean, maybe you'd still have a minimum wage to avoid, uh, you know, various exploit exploitative uh, situations. But you could imagine, like for internships and stuff, they could get away actually paying less. You see, you see that in yeah. various cases. But but generally speaking, for most jobs, they're going to have to pay more than the uh, the wage. And, and you know, once the dust settles, I mean, there'll be there there would be an obvious transition uh, to the new system that uh, caused some disruption. Uh, but you know, eventually, you just say, well, you know, uh, a fast food job, no, oh, it's like twenty percent. You know, it's like twenty percent per hour more than the the job guarantee wage. You know, that you know, I don't know. I mean, twenty percent is just me picking a number at random. It's not not the result of some fancy model. But 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 basically, you'd say. You know that's roughly what you'd expect, and then you know so to a certain extent now uh, the, the government because they control the wage for the job guarantee, they they now are effectively if 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 the if the wage spread is stable, they've got a handle on setting wages. Well, they can influence wages in the private sector at least at the low end. And uh, so it's it's useful for well certainly stops de you know deflation stops wages from falling, and it can also help reduce inflation like on, on the wage side which then feeds through into uh, final output. So and uh, that's it. I mean that's sort of the theoretical and basically that the the job guarantee that was the root of MMT as a separate school of thought. You know, it was sort of uh, two people, Warren Mosler, Bill Mitchell, had come up with it independently. And, you know, they came together. And that was so sort of, it's, you know, it's a little bit arcane because it sort of said, well, how, how do you sort of fix the price level? Because this was actually, a, it was a theoretical problem in, in economics. Like, why, why is the, you know, what determines the price level in the model? And there was never a good answer. And with, with the job guarantee, you had one. But um, but that's that's pure theory. But on, on the practical basis, it is uh, a very effective um, uh, automatic stabilizer, and it works beautifully because it generates jobs exactly where people are unemployed, and that's that's what you need. Like 
the the problem in the 60s and the 70s and earlier is they would do projects. Oh, uh, unemployment's rising, so we'll do some infrastructure project. And the thing is, is though, is you know they they build you know you're, where they're hiring is not necessarily where people are losing jobs, and it's not in the right fields. Um, you know they were great for people in construction, but you know didn't help. You know, in, you know building highways doesn't help. Other, you know, it doesn't help for, uh, short order cooks lost their jobs. So you, uh, you, you directly target the areas that are weak. And also it, 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 it attaches people uh, to, the, to the workplace. Rather than paying people to do nothing, you know, they're coming in and they're learning a skill. And, you know, they, they, they learn skills. And and they sort of, they don't drift away. They're they're, they're you know because 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 it's it's not just supposed it's not supposed to be just make work. They're expected to work, and so you know they you know they they you know stay in the habit of you know uh, of working. It sounds like a really healthy idea to me. I had, I had liked the idea of a basic income, but um, I don't know. It's it's easy to imagine lots of problems with it. But the idea of a jobs guarantee, just keeping people in the loop, is good for business and and for people too, generally. Yeah, the the, the issue with the basic income is that it's going to everyone. See, with the, see the the job guarantee, it's only the people who are unemployed. It's it's yeah. like if it can't really overstimulate the economy because if if uh, you know if the economy starts booming, well, firms firms are going to take people. They're going to bid up labor and take them out of the job here so eventually there's gonna be no one in the program so the the spending disappears a basic income it's going to absolutely everyone uh regardless of the state of the economy i mean there there, there are some things where people say well we do it in a downturn which is sort of what happened in 2020 that i guess makes more sense and in 2020 was actually the best option it was almost the only option we had is just yeah. send people cash but um you know the uh, it's that's the thing is that you you know you're you're always shoveling income into the economy and the eventually yes it's it's going to have to be offset you're 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 gonna have to offset that income and what will happen is is that for the for the average person uh, let me see a typical person let's say i don't know average uh it's a bit too math but for, for a lot of people you know their, their position is, you know, you'd expect their net position not to be changed. You know, they're, they're going to be paying more in tax than what they're, uh, you know, it's gonna, they're going to have an increased tax bill that matches what they're getting from the, the basic income. And so what they're seeing is, you know, they're going to have a, a much higher marginal tax rate. So they're going to be looking at their tax rate. And it's all, you know, yeah, they get a UBI and it's all being taxed away. So it's going to be very easy for a politician to say, look, we'll reduce the the basic income and we can bring down taxes. And for everyone at the top of the distribution, will go, yay, and that'll be it. And that'll be the end of the basic income. So, I mean, that's the thing is it's it sounds nice, but politically, politically, it's just, it, I mean, there's a reason why Milton Friedman the libertarians liked it because it's going to be very easy uh, to just whittle the program away. I heard about and I, I read in, again, Kelton's book and also in your book about uh, natural unemployment rate and that the government will actually adjust interest rates in such a way to raise unemployment if they think that unemployment is too low. And that seems like cruel to me almost. Yeah. Well, but um, is it true that they do that? Yes, that's that's they, they they use euphemism. I mean, they don't really want to say that, but yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. the 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 belief is is that there's the oh, not it's it's Nairu, like it's, over time the uh, they they've changed the names because basically the older theoretical versions failed and they came up with new ones, and so the names kept changing. But uh, the, see, the natural rate of unemployment was the first thing they called it, but then it morphed into Nairu, which is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Okay. No one, no one, no one ever says that. I have to, I have to look up the spelling every time I use it in the book. I, I write it out once and just go back to Nairu. But the the idea is that if the 
the unemployment rate drops below Nairu, inflation will start to accelerate. And uh, so that means that, you know, they if, if it gets below that, well, they, the, the central bank, the, the hike rates, because they, they want to keep inflation your target. And so... Uh, you know the, the, the you know the, the fear is that oh no inflation is going to accelerate because it's accelerating it's not just inflation rate will rise it'll keep rising it's going to accelerate and uh, it'll go faster and faster if, if it's allowed to drop and so they they raise interest rates to try and slow the economy in which uh, effectively yeah they, they 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 want to raise the unemployment rate but they don't exactly no they the central bankers don't want to see they, they they talk about the good stuff they say oh we're we we want to stop inflation they're not going to say oh we want to throw people out of work because uh you know we you know we're worried about inflation they they don't put it that way but that's you know that that is what the theory is and that's not in practice what they what they aim for yeah, that's but, one of the reasons that I, I like learning about this stuff to some extent is because I want to understand what they're actually saying when they say yeah. things, although I don't have any direct control over it. But yeah, yeah like, yeah. yeah, and I mean, that's the, the, the issue. It's, it's a, the, the point is like the, the analysis in my book that this, you know, that rate of it doesn't really exist. I mean, there is you can't find it in the data. And so it's purely, you know, there's no, you know. You know the the point is with the job guarantee. If you had a you know, if, let's say if you have a job guarantee, you could have no unemployment because you have you know you'd have people in the the job guarantee program, and some people say that's like being unemployed, but whatever, they're not working in the private sector. But there's no reason for you know wages to accelerate because the 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 job guarantee is fixed. And why why would you like if you're in the private sector? Like if you if you're a low wage job, you set your wage relative to the the job guarantee wage. You don't. There's no particular reason for you to just hike it. You know why why hike it? So, but uh, I mean that 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 is a, an argument. Like whether or not that's true or not, no one is going to agree on. This is it'll come down to battling theories. And that and be honest, uh, no one no one's going to have a good answer. I mean, everyone. Everyone is be very confident in their answer, but uh, whether any of them are true, I don't know. So, okay, I once got in an argument online with an economist who said that poverty is the natural state, and it seems to me that poverty, as we know it, is a position in society, and it's only natural to those who are in it right now. So, is that a fundamental axiom of economic science that poverty is the natural state? just because maybe a bank account is at zero dollars by default or is that just like his opinion yeah i, I that i i mean I, I would have to see the context but i the i mean i guess certainly people would argue uh, on the free market side anyway that you expect to have a dispersion of incomes i mean there's a bit of a theory there uh behind that which which i i don't want to go to but, but basically they, they believe that i don't necessarily i'm not entirely convinced but in practice there is like if capitalism the way it works now you have a dispersion of incomes and so you have high income people you have low income people the question is do the people at the bottom rungs of the income distribution do they have to live in poverty well i mean I, it depends if, if you define poverty as being in the bottom 10 percent of the distribution then you by definition, you're going to have people in poverty, even if they're living in mansions. They're just, you know, 90% of the people have bigger mansions. So, like, but it, poverty normally is defined in an absolute sense. So, no, I don't, I mean, that, that doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we can, you know, quite obviously take every, you know, we, we can get all Canadians out of poverty. Globally, I mean, then there's another issue. Well, do we have the resources to, to do that, to take everyone out of a poverty level? Um, I, th I think you can get rid of, you know, starvation and things like that. That's, that's sort of less controversial, but you know, there's, you know, there's limits on how far you could raise living standards, but whether, you know, whether, you know, it just now becomes, what do you define as poverty? If people aren't starving, if they have clean water, 
well, you know, I mean, you know, we can get rid of that, but uh, you know, whether you, you could get everyone to a Western standard of living, you know, cause, cause you just run into, you'd run into resource constraints. I mean, us people, people in the developed countries are consuming, you know, vast amounts of resources and that's, there's no uh, uh, doubt about that uh, com compared to the weight of the population. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the other ones have to, you know, it's, you know that you know uh, how how you could even things out, but you know it's but it, it comes down to how you define poverty. Yeah. Okay. So surely our homes and businesses function better when we learn about microeconomics. So I'm assuming that democracy would function better and society would function better if we were all a bit more knowledgeable about macroeconomics. Yeah. So what are some resources? Unless you disagree with that, what are some resources, maybe some books we could read for beginners to learn about macroeconomics? Yeah, for for uh, learning about macro, I mean, like I I will have a book that's easier to read. That's my next target. So, but uh, it's not out. I'll be on inflation. But the uh, like I say, for as a beginner. My books are not the place to start. Um, I, I won't. I won't lie. Uh, I mean, there is a fair amount. I mean, the advantage of like like Kelton's Stephanie Kelton's book is it, it's covering a lot of the basis, uh, and then there's similar resources for like MMT, but you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be MMT. You you'll find other places. But what you what the advantage of sort of saying. You you gotta say no one in economics agrees with anyone else. Like one, okay. once you accept this, um, you, then you realize well okay fine and just you know to a certain extent you you gotta be somewhat open minded and then you ju just search around. But see a lot a lot of like if macroeconomics most of it is tied to discussions of uh, financial markets. So a lot a lot of the economic macro discussions shows up in um, pl places where they've got, you know, market commentary. You know, some things where they talk about, you know, here, here's what's happening with this company, but then you'll have story, you know, commentary. And, and those one, I mean, they're, uh, if you read that, like, you know, people's commentary, you know, you can then, you know, say, ah, here's a good article and go, and go around. But, uh, Central banks, like central bank websites, like Bank of Canada, United States, there is a lot of. Let's say you want, if you want to learn about, like, what is the CPI, the best place to go is either StatsCan or the uh, the the U.S. has, as you know, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They've they've got tons of stuff on inflation and interest rates. You want to know about interest rate policy? You know, I don't agree with how the bank can analyze this thing but you, you sort of have to understand what are they looking at and they have all kinds of material going from propaganda aimed at uh, you know elementary school kids to, to more advanced uh, things I mean it, it covers all levels of, of reading and they're they're good sources and various uh, uh, national sources so I mean that's uh, that that's where I would say, and if not books, I mean go go into a library. But I like I would say textbooks. I would recommend <laughs> they're 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 they're, they're, they're they're most most textbooks you see aren't covering what you're interested in. Okay. Yeah, I found, when I was reading your book, I referred to the Bank of Canada website uh, yeah. several times, and that was surprisingly helpful. They they describe it in pretty clear language. Yeah. Some yeah. of the basic functions. Yeah, the like I said, that's that's really it. I mean, I I think the the advantage of sort of just reading commentary, um, you know, you can see the arguments; they're fun. You see, and that's the thing. Like you, uh, you know, if you read enough of them, you'll begin to realize everyone's arguing with each other, and so you hopefully pick up on the thing. You, like one one of the thing is you see people identify with a certain political team, and they say my team is right, the other side wrong. You know, the the correct way to do it is like, hey, none of these people agree with each other. What's up with that? You know, but the thing is, you see the arguments and you just pick up and you just pick up the information. But see, generally speaking, you you get some really wonky sources uh, out there. I mean, I'm I have a blog. I mean, I I'd, I mean, 
I, I would be very cautious about sort of random sources. You, you sort of need to that, you know, where, where your things come from, because there's a lot of absolutely insane things that people insist are true. And, uh, you know, that's the thing is that you've, you know, you, you, you have to be suspicious of most things that you're reading, but the, the advantage, at least of, let's say central banks, and things, they, you know, they, 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 they're, they've got a certain political bias that, but at least they're, you know, somewhat reality based. So, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, other than that, cause see, I don't really read primers. I mean, I went straight into textbooks and things like that. So I like, but I see, I read financial, but for that, the like, sort of commentary you get, like uh, some of my articles I picked up on seeking alpha, I think things like that or op-ed, they, they give you an introduction. And then after that, you can just sort of browse find a topic and dig, you know, what, what you're interested in, maybe find a book. But I mean, obviously the, the, I would say the key thing is everyone has an ideological ax to grind and uh, you, you, you really have to keep that in mind. I mean, everyone wants to pretend it's a science, it's no politics. It's, it's all politics. And, okay. and you, you've, you've got to watch out for that. Okay. So what's a good, get rich quick scheme <laughs> um yeah generally i mean i mean i i stay, stay away from anything <laughs> that can get me in a legal problem but i'm not the person to ask you know i i look at um i i'm sort of a get rich slow scheme like see <laughs> for my day job in finance it was fixed income and you know, it was for a large fund manager and so everything i was involved in were very large trade sizes like for example a small trade is a hundred million dollars so that i mean that's the way it works that fixed income it's it's big they're big portfolio and so uh, i don't have that kind of money lying around my house so like uh, the stuff that i did my day job i can't do it all so that keeps me out of trouble and because there was riskier stuff that we would have done relatively but like I, I i can't do that so it's not my problem and i'm fairly cautious but generally speaking with invest i mean i think the first thing is you you know you you do have to get a basic idea of what the things are um you have to be ca very cautious that you don't run into scams and things like that 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 is the the problem but you know, like a bank, like things like buying mutual funds are designed to be safe for, for people. And, you, you know, you can learn about there's There's tons of stuff for personal finance. But realistically, you can make money doing your thing. Like, you know, but it's a job. If, if you if you you can either get lucky or you can work. But the thing is, if you're going to I mean, my attitude is, well, if, I'm, if it's a job, you know, why am I why am I doing this job? Is there anything else I could do? And realistically, for like for someone who's middle class uh, style income, the, the 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 safest road is that if you're going to spend time, is actually to reduce expenses. That's that's uh, it's ugly, but no, no, it's the thing that no one wants to hear. But that's the you know if if you read, I think there's two books. I think. There's the Wealthy Barber, which is a classic Canadian bestseller. I don't know. I, it's a great book. I mean, it's sort of very personalized. It's it's the kind of book I would write, but uh, it's it's you no, know, it's one thing. The other one, which is a bit more dry, is the Millionaire Next Door. There's a few offshoots, whereas it, that one is sort of uh, you know they looked at the the. the basis of that one they said let's see what actual millionaires did and you know how you know how how did they you know manage things and it was totally the the authors were sort of totally blown away because what people's image of what a millionaire is had you know this is back in the 90s when a million was you know a bigger amount of money but uh the you know people had a totally wrong conception of uh, what mil millionaires tended to be cheap people that that was sort of they you know they they weren't for everyone assumed oh they're rich they're flashy the only sort of rich flashy people uh who stayed rich are people who are bringing in so much income 
so fast they just can't spend it fast enough. There's, you know, it's like a few, you know, billionaires. But for otherwise, in most cases, uh, most of the people who actually had money and took it actually, you know, they, you know, they were not, you know, they were unflashy. And, uh, and that's it. It's just basically, it's a, it's a thing that you can control. And uh, obviously, like, you know, not losing money in your investing is, is important. So you have to have a little bit of financial knowledge. But uh, at the end of the day, like if you don't have a lot of money saved, at best you can add a couple percent to your returns, you know, realistically. But, you know, just not eating out, hey, you can, you know, the, the dollar amount could actually be larger, at least yeah. when you're younger. And that's really it. It's not, it's, it's exactly what people don't want to hear. But that's the, uh, you know, in, in terms of it's going to take time and realistically, in most cases, if you're living a middle class lifestyle, your time, you know, saving time is what you're spending money on in, in many cases. And that's it. So if you spend the time, well, actually focus it on reducing expenses. Okay. Well, Brian Romanchuk, I think I mispronounced your name the first oh, time. I, I don't I mean, I, like, I'm not sure how you do the, the proper Ukrainian pronunciation, to be honest. Uh, I mean, it, it, you, need, you need a little bit, you do it with an accent to do it properly. And I, I actually switch. I mean, I think what someone pronounces it one way, I'll pronounce it back the same way. Because it could be Romanchuk or Romanchuk. I just, you know, I, I, I flip between them. And I don't really, like that, you know, I know it's not, not neither of them is, really the way it's supposed to be pronounced and so i don't really I, I don't even notice at this point no the what i find though is no one spell everyone puts it with a ck at the end but that's every, every single job they i show up and every, everything is configured with ck and i spend my first week on the job saying well no no you gotta change that that's not my, that's that's the wrong spell. <laughs> okay so where can people find you online it's uh, bondeconomics.com Okay. Uh, which is my website, and uh, it's a you know it's a blog. The other the other I'm on Twitter. I believe my handle is Romanchuk Brian. Uh, if not, it's Brian Romanchuk, and I'm I'm on there. That's about the only social media I'm I I'm you know active on. I have I have a Facebook page, but I I logged in I think uh, once in the past year, so it's. Uh, but the, the the blog and I, I publish twice a week articles. They tend to be um, excerpts, like either uh, something I'm mad about and I write about, or it's uh, um, I'm, I, I I do draft sections of my books. I publish them uh, to get people's feedback and uh, before I stick it in a book. And I'm writing them. That's the thing. So right now I'm writing about inflation, and it's um, aimed to be. Uh, easy to, it's supposed to be aimed at a wider audience so hopefully uh, so someone someone who's interested at least that part uh, those articles will hopefully be up their alley because it's inflation is obviously a topic that people are interested in yeah. uh, my other ones are a bit more you know arguing about theory but I also have articles about MMT and uh, and then also if someone has a question I'm, I'm, I'm usually approachable I'm not overwhelmed with uh, people contacting me so they could you know certainly on twitter just you know tweet at me or whatever and ask me questions no problem and when will that inflation book be out um based on my i've been doing about one a year so it'd be nice to do it by december but i think i say that every year um yeah my my target would be I, th I think the writing will be largely finished. The, the writing will be finished by September to October. Uh, whether it gets out in December, I don't know. It'll, it, it could be later. Uh, it, it depends. I, I, I like to let my I, – I basically, I, I let my uh, – I, I put down my manuscript, go away from and then come back. So uh, I, I – it, you know, the I'm usually working on my next project. Um by by the time I'm, you know, it's b before my you know the current book is published. Well, I really appreciate this. Thanks very much for the time. Okay, no problem.